Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. I welcome you all to today's Hindu analysis. Before we go deeper into the important articles of the Hindu newspaper, a couple of very important announcements. Number one, Baiju's is giving you a chance to prove how prepared are you for the UPSC examination. You can do that by registering in the National Scholarship Test organized by Baiju's on 14th of August, 11 a.m. This test gives you a chance to win up to 90% scholarship on the Baiju's IAS courses. The link to register for this test is given in the description of the video. Do register in large numbers. It is an online test. The link to register will be open till 14th of August 6 a.m. So that is the deadline to register. 11 a.m. is when the test begins. The next announcement is about this week's explained session that always goes live as you know on our YouTube channel at Friday at 8 p.m. This will be on the topic of government's decision to withdraw the data protection bill. We'll be discussing about the provisions of the bill, the requirement, why did the government withdraw it and what exactly is the plan of the future. Now let's come back to the first important article of the day that is about the G20. Now, the author here is a former United Nations diplomat from the side of India. He is saying that India that will hold the presidency of the G20 from December 2022 till 2023, this one year presents a chance for India to actually set a good mission for the G20 to achieve. As you know, G20 is a group of 20 members that are the most developed and advanced and strong economies around the world. They are the ones who set an important agenda, which the world then follows throughout the entire year. The nation which plays the president of the G20 on a rotation basis gets the chance to decide the agenda for the discussion and that agenda is then followed. Thus, it puts India into a great place to dictate what can be the mission of the G20 going forward. The author here is saying that the Indian government has committed a mistake. Why? If you go and look at the website of the Ministry of External Affairs, the website says that India, as a president of the G20, will be focusing on a large range of issues. Economic sectors, energy, agriculture, trade, digital economy, health, employment, tourism, anti-corruption, women empowerment, etc. etc. He says that this is a big mistake. Rather than focusing on all these things, India should be clever and choose only two or three objectives, which are the requirement of the time. That will give us a better chance of achieving something concrete in these areas. So India should not spread itself too thin. We should rather focus on a handful of the issues. He also says that we must focus on collaborations and not commitments. Now what does it mean? See, whenever you have international summits, be it the climate change summit, the energy summit, human rights, etc. In all those summits, at the end of it, the nations make big commitments. For example, in the Paris climate deal, all of them made commitments, we'll cut down our emissions by this much, we'll do this and that. But since these are not legally binding, these are never ever fulfilled by the governments. So we should not focus on commitments, rather we should focus on collaborations. Collaboration means the nations coming together, helping each other, especially the bigger nations trying to help the smaller nations that will make a better world going forward. So the focus should not be just on giving long joint statements. The focus should be on concrete agreements that two or three nations or a group of smaller nations can come together and sign. That is how we'll be focusing much more on the collaborations between the two sides and not just commitments which are never fulfilled. The author here has given a lot of suggestions for India to go ahead and talk about in the upcoming G20 summit. For example, he starts by saying that India should collaborate on limited areas as I discussed. The external affairs ministry talks about a lot of areas which India will be focusing on. Rather than that, as per the author, we should only focus on a few issues which are important around the world. Development in science and technology, human rights issues, sustainable development goals and that is it. Similarly, we should also focus on hydrogen economy which is also a part of science and tech. Hydrogen economy as you know means increase use of hydrogen as a fuel because it's a very very clean fuel it does not have any byproducts there is no wastage and thus it is a fuel of the future so we should have collaborations on how can we go ahead and share technology to make the entire world a better place by using more and more hydrogen 
Also, we should talk about the changing cropping patterns that are required. We should also ensure that we exchange as much as we know about different technologies, meaning that we should have open access softwares and rather than one single country or two countries reaping all the benefits of development, we should actually spread it across the world so that other countries can also take advantage of it. We should also collaborate in space, share the data and technologies. Public health also has to be in focus, sharing of information and other kinds of things which will help us in preventing future pandemics. Ensure free and open navigation across the oceans and also ensure that globally we come back and think about the idea of global financial transaction tax. This was an idea that was first given in G20 of 2011, but it was not really implemented. The idea is, if we have a kind of a global tax, then the money coming from these tax proceeds can actually be given to the least developed nations. Because right now, the least developed nations are just dependent on the goodwill of the developed nations. The developed nations, whenever they want, they can give some money. Otherwise, they can just ignore their request. But having such kind of a tax which is compulsory will ensure that the least developed nations actually get this. Now, these are the important pointers from this article. Now, let me try and share with you a trick of how to remember the member nations of G20. This question has been asked in the prelims examination earlier as well. On YouTube, you would find a mnemonic series that we have done on our Baiju's YouTube channel, where I made a lot of videos about how to remember a lot of important groupings. In one of those videos, I had discussed how can you remember the member nations of G20. Now, this is a kind of a mnemonic that you can use. You just have to remember the capital letters. Oh, either this one or the second one. If you just remember the capital letters, you would be good to go. If you look at the first one, G stands for Germany, U for USA, R for Russia, U for United Kingdom, so on and so forth. Guruji Sita ab SSC FCI mein job karti hai. Again, remember only the capital letters. Either you can go with the first one or the second one. This question about the G20 member nations has been asked in the prelims examination. Now about the G20, this is one of those groups that keep on coming in the news time and time again. Remember, if you are defining G20, please don't write that it is a group of 20 nations because that is not true. There are 19 nations and then the 20th member is EU. EU, as you know, has multiple nations. So it's not a group of 20 nations. It's a group of 20 members, basically. Apart from that, they also have representatives from the IMF and the World Bank. They don't have any of their permanent secretariat and that is why they hold their meetings in the member nations only on a rotation basis. They are the group of 20 most advanced nations across the world and obviously they contribute about 80% of the global GDP and 80% of the global investment. Each G20 country is represented by its Sherpa. Sherpa is kind of a person, a delegate from each country that will go to G20 who actually plans on behalf of their country. So before the G20 summit actually takes place, a few weeks before that, Sherpa or representatives from each of the nations actually go there, note down what we will be discussing, decide the common agenda and then they let their government know that this is what we will be discussing and then the heads of the government come and start the discussion. Recently, there was a news that India has appointed Amitabh Kant as a G20 Sherpa. Amitabh Kant, as you know, worked in the Niti Aayog for a long time as a CEO. Now he has left the CEO and now he has been given another assignment by the government. The next article that we have is about the BSNL. We had discussed about the BSNL a few days ago as well when we were discussing about the revival package that the union cabinet has announced for the BSNL. Just a reminder. The reunion government recently announced that they will be spending 1.64 lakh crore rupees to revive the BSNL. As you know, BSNL is in a very bad state, mainly because the telecom sector is now dominated by the private companies such as Jio, Airtel, Vodafone, Idea. BSNL, which about two decades ago used to be one of the market leaders in the telecom field, is now in a very, very bad situation because of various reasons, some of which we had already discussed earlier as well in one of the CNAs. This article specifically talks about a lot of data and numbers in terms of the losses that BSNL has been facing. And it also says 
just announcing money to the bsnl will not really help the situation because the bsnl's problems are not solvable just by money these are long term problems and they needs to be a long term solution for that if you look at the subscriber base of bsnl it is very very low the subscriber base of jio and airtel means the number of people who use these connections is three times as that of the bsnl in fact the average revenue that bsnl actually earns per person or per customer is also very very low the other problem that bsnl has is since it's a government organization they can't let people go and because of which they have too many employees in fact the money that the bsnl spends out of its revenue for its employees salaries and pensions is extremely extremely high much more higher than any other private player such as airtel jio etc and that is a big big difference if you can see in 2005 the situation was very very different in 2005 bsnl had a 21% market share they were the combined market leader along with airtel now their market share is not even 10% it's the private players that control most of the market the problem also started with the introduction of jio when all the data prices crashed down in the market and every company had to reduce its revenues because jio was forcing them to do that the problem was that bsnl although they reduced the revenues were not able to sustain because they had a lot of employees their salaries pension etc to take care of and that is what ensured that they had huge losses in fact in the last 13 years bsnl losses have been 1.02 trillion just imagine the kind of losses that bsnl has actually incurred in the past decade or so as you can see until the financial year of 2020 employee benefits such as salary pension etc were 40% of the bsnl's expenses so whatever bsnl was earning 40% of it was spent just on employee benefit for companies such as airtel this number is not even 10% they don't even spend 10% on the benefits of the employees so just imagine the kind of money airtel would have at its disposal for expanding technology etc as compared to what bsnl would have the government of india thus in 2019 tried to ask many people from bsnl to retire prematurely that was called voluntary retirement scheme so that at least a salary part of the bsnl actually comes down so that has improved the situation in the bsnl but still the amount of money that they spend on their employees is very very high as compared to the private companies the one other argument that many people give in favor of bsnl is since it's a government company their aim and their purpose should not be to be very profitable their purpose should be to ensure that telecom services are given even in those areas where private sector would not go see just think of it from point of view of private sector jio airtel etc they would only make towers and give connections in those areas where they feel that they can actually earn profit meaning that if they think that in a certain area there are very few people living there is no point for them to make a new tower there and give their services because the cost benefit analysis for them is not that great so in rural areas they don't really spend a lot of money in investment but bsnl on the other hand is the only government player in this field and that is why bsnl has a responsibility to connect all the people irrespective of whether or not they can earn a profit out of it so bsnl's entire motive should never be to earn profit as per many people who have always supported the existence of bsnl now this article in the hindu newspaper gives you a lot of graph specifically to show the market share of bsnl how it has declined over the years from 21% at its peak it has reached 10% jio has the biggest market share of 36% right now airtel is also very close to jio only similarly the average revenue that is earned per customer is very very low for bsnl as compared to the other private players so just by giving them money the problem would not really be solved there have to be structural changes made in the bsnl and mtnl also this is not the first time that government has tried to revive bsnl government has tried to revive bsnl earlier also in 2019 as we discussed the vrs scheme voluntary retirement scheme was introduced and even before that the government has tried various ways to revive the fortunes of bsnl and mtnl but they have not really worked well 
So this time around also, the government must ensure that something different is done because the same old thing might not give the kind of results that we are actually hoping for. The next article that we have here is about a very important law passed in the US, which the US media is describing as a game changer. Now, Joe Biden, ever since he became the president, has been promising a lot in terms of climate change and how the US will actually fight for the environment. However, the US works in such a way that if the government is not able to pass the bill in the parliament, the president alone cannot really spend a lot of money. So whenever Joe Biden actually tried to introduce such a bill, the parliament would not really pass it. Joe Biden earlier had introduced a bill called the Build Back Better Initiative, which was called Triple BI, Build Back Better Initiative. That was also an initiative in which the US government would have spent trillions of dollars for building good infrastructure in terms of renewable energy, etc. But that bill could not be passed in the parliament. Mainly because a lot of parliamentarians supported the corporates, supported the fossil fuel industry, which was against this bill. Now, the present bill, which is called Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, is a lighter version of the Build Back Better initiative only. Under this bill, about $369 billion will be spent for clean energy transition. It also talks about tax initiatives, tax reductions for low-income households, so on and so forth. Now, do understand something about the US politics. There are two very important things. Number one, you all know that US president elections are separate and US parliament elections are separate. Meaning that it can very easily happen that the US president is from a separate political party, while the US parliament might have a majority of a different party. Although that is not the case right now, the Democrat party from which Joe Biden is a the president, they have the majority in the lower house, in the upper house also it's 50-50, but the casting vote is with the vice president that again is from the Democrat party. But when Barack Obama was a president, he was from Democrat party and the Republicans were in the majority in the parliament. So what it means is it is not necessary that every bill that the US president wants will pass. The US president may want to pass a bill, but it is not necessary that his party is in the majority. So it's not easy for US president to actually get a bill passed. The second important thing here is the US politics is different in the sense that they don't have something called the anti-defection law. In India, the members of parliament are bound by the directions given by their party. But in the US, that is not the case. So even if the Democrat party has introduced the bill, they would have to convince their own members first to actually vote for the bill because it is not necessary that all of their members will actually vote for the bill. These members vote in terms of what their people want, in terms of what their voters would want or what their contributors or donors like companies etc. would want and not what their members would want. So Democrat party had a hard time in convincing their own members of parliament also to vote for the bill. In that sense, passing of this bill is a huge achievement of the US government. The reason why they have done this is because like other countries also, US is also facing a lot of extreme climate threats right now. The US is facing heat waves, there are wildfires, cyclones in some parts of the US that are just becoming too frequent with every passing year. In 2021, the US president had announced that America will cut down its emission by 50 to 52 percent as compared to 2005 level by 2030. In order to achieve that goal, it is extremely necessary that this bill was actually passed and the US shifts towards a clean energy and transitions towards that side. As I told you, the bill was not that easy to pass because the Republican Party was not in favor of it. The Republican Party has always been known to be much closer to the industries, the fossil fuel industry, etc., that works for oil, coal, which would not want the government to go towards a renewable energy space. That is why there was a lot of opposition to the bill as well. But thankfully, the bill has now been passed. And as per many experts, this will keep the US on track to achieve this emission reduction target. Now, US is not the only country that has been working on this kind of a plan. If you remember a few days back in one of the CNAs only, I had discussed something about the Fit for 55 program. If you remember, Fit for 55 program is a program by European Union. The aim is 
to reduce emission by 55% by 2030. They also have a similar plan of going towards renewable energy. Similarly, Japan has a plan called Invest in Kisida. This is a plan under which the Japanese government will spend 1.1 trillion dollar to bolster the Japanese economy, especially to transition towards clean energy. So it's not that only US is doing it; many other developed nations are doing it. But therein lies a very important question. See, the developed countries have this money, and they can actually take these decisions to transition to clean energy. But what about the nations that are not so rich? What about the developing nations, the least developed nations? Even if these nations want to transition towards clean energy, they actually need a lot of money and investment. From where would they get it? That has always been a big question. That is where the question of climate finance comes into the picture. I'll discuss about climate finance also, but before that, this is an important graph that you must understand. This is a graph given by the Imperial College in UK, in which they talk about the fact that the targets that the nations across the world have made they are just not enough. They say that if all the pledges and targets that were given by the nations in the Paris Climate Deal, if all of these are fulfilled, which will not be the case, even then the Earth's temperature will rise by 2.1 degrees Celsius. If the 2030 targets are met from the different nations, even then the temperature of the Earth will increase by 2.4 degrees Celsius. So the aim of keeping the temperature till the limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius doesn't really seem to be happening, even if all these promises are fulfilled. So there has to be a much much bigger commitment from nations across the world. Now let's come back to the concept of climate finance. As I said, the problem is not with the developed nations. They have the money; they can spend it. It is just their internal politics that is stopping them from spending it. The question is mostly about the developing nations, from where they do get the money. And the interesting part is that everyone agrees that the problem in the environment is mostly because of the developed nations, because of their industrial revolution, because of their machinery. So obviously, they should take a higher responsibility of ensuring that they give money to the developing nations. That is where the concept of common but differentiated responsibility comes into the picture. There have been multiple attempts in the past for climate financing. That is, the developed nations agreeing to give money to the developing nations in the form of grants, so that clean energy can be introduced in developing nations. Also, we have had a lot of talks about this in the 2009 climate change summit at Copenhagen, where the target was set. That hundred billion dollars would be contributed by developed nations by 2020. In Paris Climate Summit, the aim was postponed to 2025. But the problem is, even today, there has not been any clarity on how much money has actually been deposited. The problem also is that the developed nations want to give money as a loan and not as a grant. The problem with loan is that loan has to be returned back, while grant is kind of a donation. The developing nations and the least developed nations want a grant and not a loan, but the developed nations want to give this money in the form of a loan. Also, when you talk about climate change, there are two very important words that come time and time again: mitigation and adaptation. Please do understand the difference between the two. Adaptation means adapting to what has actually changed in the environment, not really working to stop the heating of the earth, just changing our methods so that we can survive even in higher temperature. That is called adaptation. Mitigation, on the other hand, means working towards reducing the temperature. That is called mitigation. Mitigation will actually ensure that we actually reduce the temperature of the earth or curtail it. Adaptation, on the other hand, means accepting that no, we can't really do anything to stop the temperature rise. So let's change the way in which we actually live. Both these are absolutely necessary for the nations across the world. We can't just focus on one and not the other. The next article that we have here is about all the strikes that we are seeing across the country because of the government's decision to introduce the Electricity Amendment Bill of 2022. As you would have seen a few days back in the Lok Sabha, Electricity Amendment Bill was introduced, but after a lot of protests, it was sent to a parliamentary committee. Now, what exactly is this bill, and what are they trying to do? Why is it 
that we see that the unions are protesting. Why is it that we see the farmers are protesting against the bill? The original electricity bill was actually passed in 2003 when Atal Bihari Vajpayee was the Prime Minister. Now, as you know, there are a lot of problems in the energy sector in India. And you might be surprised to know that India actually produces more electricity every day than we require. I'll repeat it if you did not understand this. India produces more electricity every day than what we require. Then your question should be, but then why do we have the power cuts? Why do we have power cuts in rural areas? Why do we have shortage of power? That is because the system of distributing this electricity is not up to the mark. That is because we have so many people not paying their bills or taking electricity illegally. It is the distribution part where it is a problem. So what the government is trying to do in very simple terms is, understand this, government is saying that government agencies produce electricity, that is fine. But distributing electricity, that is taking electricity and then distributing it to everyone's house should be a job given to some other private company. Those are called DISCOMs or distribution companies. In bigger cities such as Mumbai, such as Delhi, you do have this kind of a concept. That is, the DISCOM or the distribution companies are separate and the companies that produce electricity are separate. That is how it works. However, now what the government is saying is that these distribution companies can be privatized. They can be private companies as well. For example, in Mumbai, you would see there's Adani power, there is Tata power, so on and so forth. So the bill is actually trying to privatize the distribution companies, the companies which will buy electricity from the government and then they will distribute it, supply it to everyone's household. That is the job of the distributing companies that are called DISCOMs. The government is trying to privatize them. Now, why are the people protesting against it? See, those who are protesting against it are actually in the two groups. First group is of the farmers. Why are the farmers protesting? The farmers are saying that now that private companies are coming into the picture, the electricity subsidy that we were getting because farmers across the country were getting electricity at a much cheaper cost. They are saying because the private companies will come in, now the subsidy will go away. The private companies will force us to pay higher bills. That is one reason for the opposition for the farmers. Then the labor unions, the workers who work in the electricity boards across the country, they are also protesting. Why? They think that if the private companies come up, if the distribution companies become privatized, then there will be job cuts, there will be job losses because they also know that in the government, if the job can be done by 80 people, the government will employ 120 people and will give everyone a job. But private companies, if their job can be done by 80 people, will actually employ 75 people only and will force these 75 to work for 80 people. This is why the people are now scared that their job will be lost if the private companies take over distribution companies. This is the entire point of the protest. There are some other amendments to the bill also. For example, centre government is giving more power to itself to decide about who can be electricity distributors and who cannot be. Till now, Power distribution came under the state governments and that is why state governments are not happy because they think that their power is being taken away. Also, the other law is the private companies are not expected to set up their own electricity lines, their own towers and poles. No, they can use the existing structure of the government companies, the government distribution companies that have their structure of the towers, wires, etc. The same can be used by the private companies. Also, they don't have to build any parallel network. The distribution network has already been set up. They just have to take the license and they have to start the work. Now, there is an interesting political point of view also here. If you see the politics around the country, most of the state governments, most of the regional parties actually announce free electricity up to a certain point of time. So electricity has actually become a tool for freebies or welfare or getting votes. Now that the power of the state government is being taken away and it is being given to central government, the state governments obviously will not be happy about it. Now, as of today also, there are separate distribution companies. Today also, the company that actually produces electricity is separate, that is C1, and the distribution company that actually distributes these are different. These are not the same companies. 
but the difference is that these discoms today are government owned because they are government owned they are very relaxed the government can put pressure on them but when they are all private companies then the government will not be able to put pressure now what is the problem here let's try and understand let's say punjab announces that we will give free electricity to the people now when they give electricity to the people discoms or distribution companies they have their expense so when punjab government says that we are giving free electricity what exactly is happening is punjab government is paying the bill of the people on their behalf to the discoms so people are not paying their bill but someone is paying their bill that is the punjab government is saying we will pay your bill to the discoms you don't have to pay so in effect these state governments actually owe a lot of money to the discoms but because these discoms are government companies only they can't force the state government to give them money immediately that is why see 76000 crore rupees of payment the state government still have to give to the discom distribution companies why because they're just delaying it they know they are the government they can't be forced but now when the discoms are private companies adani reliance tata etc now the state governments cannot delay it because now if the state government say we'll give you money later these discoms will just cut the electricity and they will say okay when you give us the money then we'll resume the electricity that is the big problem here right now the discoms are all going into losses because the state governments owe so much money to the discoms and they are not giving them on time that is the problem that the discoms have because of a lot of losses that they are facing there are some other problems also that discoms are facing the infrastructure of electricity distribution in india is very very old so they have their own technical and commercial losses their investment in building infrastructure in the rural areas also that money has not come back the state governments don't pay them money on time the transformers etc are not really up to the mark a lot of electricity is consumed illegally you would have seen in smaller cities villages etc people just put a hook in hindi you call it kanta they just put a hook on the main line and they take electricity without actually paying any bill there are many consumers who are using electricity without their meter connections and the government is not taking any action against those because again discoms are government companies only and even if they go into losses government is happy just getting the votes from the people The next article that we have here is the headline of the Hindu newspaper today. That is, the centre government releases 1.16 lakh crore rupees to the states, making the states happy because the centre government has said that we have given you the money for GST compensation for two months and not just one month. So they have given money for two months together so that the money with the state governments can increase. Now, what is the idea here? Now, as you know, GST compensation ended recently, meaning that. now if there is a shortfall in the gst collection for the state government the center government will not compensate for that that was only for 5 years because that has ended many state governments are unhappy that they don't have enough money now so to make them happy the center government has given them twice the money in one go now what is the problem with the states because the state governments do not have enough money they are delaying their salary they are delaying the pension even the state government's contribution to central sponsored scheme those are also getting delayed so at the end of the day when the state governments don't have enough money it is going against the interest of the people of india specifically those employees of the state government only so to make them happy the center government has given them money also don't think this is free of cost extra money okay the center government is not like they are giving double the money what they are saying is we are giving you two months of money at once it's not that we are just doubling your money so for this month and the next month we are giving you the money in advance so that you can actually spend it right now it's just that they are giving two months of money in one single go now what is this money all about as you know the gst that we pay goes to the center government then center government distributes that gst to the state government that is that money so it's not a freebie to the state governments it is their money only just that the center government has giving them two months of money in one go to ensure that they can actually spend money on salaries pensions which were being delayed the reason why center government has been able to do this is because the collection of gst has increased considerably the central government is getting money from fuel petrol diesel also the collection has been good and that is why 
the finance ministry has said that we are assisting the states also hoping that they would also spend the money on capital they would also spend the money on salaries pensions etc and government servants will get their salaries on time now the problem of fiscal federalism that is a problem of states not having enough money or enough financial independence has been a very old issue in india let me give you certain reasons for that number 1 the gst ever since the gst has come into the picture the states power to decide on the taxes even on their state list items has actually gone away also gst goes to central government first then they take their own sweet time then they transfer it to the states they also delay this transfer many times so the states don't really have any more power of taxation the central government also puts a lot of cess and surcharge the problem is the money from cess and surcharge is not divided between center and the states it is exclusively with the center government there is also issue of different types of rate of interest just imagine this when the central government takes money from the market they only have to pay 7% rate of interest but when the state governments borrow money from the market they have to pay 10% rate of interest there is absolutely no logic behind that ever since the pandemic hit the central government also suspended the mp led scheme so the money that was given to the mps that is 5 crore rupees for the development of their constituency that has also been stopped the state governments are also forced to contribute to centrally sponsored schemes their contribution from the states is not something that the states can say no to and that is why their hands are tied even more now there have been multiple commissions formed in the past they have suggested a lot of ideas let me share with you one example that is of the panchi commission they suggested to minimize discretionary transfer of power that is the states should be asked to decide on their own which scheme do they want to contribute in and which scheme do they not want to contribute the central government should also take the liabilities for any central government law such as manrega etc it is a center government only that should spend all the money does the central government passing a law doesn't mean the state government should be forced to spend money the limit on professional tax should be taken away so that the money can go to the states also the targets for fiscal deficit should also come to the states and not only the center government these were the suggestions of the panchi commission and these were the important articles from the hindu newspaper today now a couple of practice questions number 1 the past couple of decades have witnessed considerable weakening of the state government's fiscal autonomy in india do you agree elaborate second playing host to the g20 summit gives a chance to india to assert its standing as a global thought leader comment both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each thank you so much for watching the video have a good day ahead